This next piece also has to go in with the science, and um, it's something that uh, it really isn't discussed when you're talking about markets, but I find that if you break down markets into these elemental categories, it gets much easier to understand how different markets behave. So there are four key elements of market mechanics. The first one is crowd size. The second one is float. Then natural demand, standardization. So these four things are incredibly powerful. Why are they powerful? Well, let's look at them individually. Each one of these has an impact on the way financial markets behave. So the first one, crowd size. This is just the total number of liquidity buyers and sellers in a given marketplace. Why is this important? Because crowd size is going to determine the level of market availability. How consistently is the market available to trade? Well, how many people are involved? If it's a small group, it's not going to be available to trade a lot. If it's a super large group, it's going to be available to trade almost all the time. But it depends on the other elements. The next element, float. What's the total outstanding size of the market? How much of the thing is out there that you want to trade? Float will, be de will determine the level of product availability. Here's an example of crowd size and float not matching up. Try buying a two-bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side. Huge crowd of people who want to buy two-bedrooms apartments on the Upper West Side, but the total outstanding float of the market's not big enough. The next element is natural demand, and not a lot of people talk about this. This is sort of like the, you know, one of the particles that's not discussed as being key to the building blocks of markets, but natural demand is the motivation of liquidity buyers. Do I need to do this thing? Do I need to buy it and sell it? Or is it just an option for me? Going back to our examples with real estate, travel, and food, which one has the highest natural demand? Food, yeah. If you don't buy that apartment or you don't take that taxi, that's fine. You don't eat, you die. So it's reoccurring demand. Like one of the businesses that never goes out of business normally is a funeral parlor. There's always natural demand for the service. It never stops. And then the last one is Standardization, the measurement of product sameness. And I hear this a lot in markets as to, how do you want to improve the market? Well, standardize the product, right? But you've got to unpack that a little bit further. What does standardizing the product actually do? It's really interesting. What standardizing the product actually does, it determines the size of the liquidity seller group. So while natural demand determines the size of the liquidity buyer group, Standardization determines the size of the liquidity seller group. How many people can offer this service of predictable immediacy? If the product is available everywhere, then you're going to get a lot of liquidity sellers. Here's an example of this. If you go to the supermarket, can you find whole milk? Right? You can find it, right? Half a gallon of whole milk in every supermarket, right? Well, my wife likes unpasteurized organic milk. There's like two stores in Brooklyn for that. So if you, the, the, the level of sameness is going to really impact how easy it is for you, if you're a liquidity buyer, to find someone who can offer it to you. Unpasteurized milk is halfway illegal. So these four things together do something quite powerful. They create the force in markets. And yes, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but I also believe that there is a force that binds everything in markets. Here's the force. If you take these four elements, ultimately, the different levels of these elements control one thing, and this one thing controls market evolution. It's transaction frequency. How frequently something trades controls the evolutionary process of every market.